Just Thank you for joining us for Community Engaged Digital Programming, a retrospective of the Tadaima Japanese American Community Pilgrimage. I'm Mia Russell, Executive Director of the Friends of Minidoka, a nonprofit organization that works to support education, research, and historic preservation of the World War II Japanese American incarceration experience. Our work focuses on the Minidoka confinement site in southern Idaho, which is now known as Minidoka National Historic Site, a unit of the National Park Service. Tonight's program is brought to you by the Friends of Minidoka, Japanese American Memorial Pilgrimages, Tadaima, a community virtual pilgrimage, the National Park Service, and the support of the National Council for Public History. For those of you who might be joining us for the first time today, I'll just briefly mention a little bit more about what the Tadaima community virtual pilgrimage was. Due to COVID-19, all annual pilgrimages to the World War II Japanese American confinement sites were canceled. These pilgrimages provide educational and community building opportunities for descendants of the camps and the wider public. Recognizing the ongoing significance of these pilgrimages, Kimiko and Hanako spearheaded a nine week virtual pilgrimage with over 50 organizations providing daily content, over 2,500 registered participants and tens of thousands of unique site visitors. This was coordinated by a committee of 16 individuals with only six weeks of preparation time before the event kicked off. Tadaima brought together many of the unique traditions from each site with new content, online exhibits, workshops, performances, lectures, panel discussions, a film festival, a book club, a community archive, firsthand testimonies, and more to create wide ranging opportunities for learning, sharing stories, and building community. Spread across nine themed weeks, the virtual pilgrimage featured both pre-recorded and live streamed content, as well as opportunities to engage with presenters and gather virtually as a community. A quick reminder for our audience, if you are joining us live today, please feel free to drop questions throughout the session in the YouTube chat feature, and we'll answer those at the end of our program. Joining me today is Hanako Wakatsuki, Acting Chief of Interpretation at Pearl Harbor National Memorial, Chief of Interpretation and Education at Minidoka National Historic Site, and co-chair of the Tadaima Community Virtual Pilgrimage. Also joining us is Kimiko Mar, co-founder of Japanese American Memorial Pilgrimages and co-chair of the Tadaima Community Virtual Pilgrimage. So hello, Kimiko and Hanako. It's great to see you back on screen. So let's jump into things and start with Kimiko. Kimiko, can you tell us more about Camp Pilgrimages, the work you do with Japanese American Memorial Pilgrimages, and how Tadaima came about? Pilgrimages uh, started about, about 50 years ago, 51 years ago, um, with Manzanar with um, a bunch of young Sansei at the time. Sansei is third generation. Um, going to Manzanar, finding the Manzanar site, which was not a national historic site. It wasn't anything. It was just out in the middle of the desert in the Eastern uh, California. And they felt some sort of connection and healing, being there, clean, cleaning up around the monument, being together um, with their uh, 
being able to commiserate about their family's experiences that their parents had not really talked about with them. And they have grown into at least, I think, five out of the 10 sites have regular pilgrimages. Um, and they vary. Uh, the programmings are totally different. Some of them, like Manzanar, it, are just a one-day event with thousands of people, and some of them are, you know, a couple hundred people and and four or five-day events sometimes. So, um, I went to my first pilgrimage about four years ago, and it was to the Minidoka pilgrimage. And um, I didn't know what they were. I'd never thought about pilgrimage, didn't have any idea until somebody invited me, Biff Brigman. And I went and was blown away and just thought, oh my God, this is, these are my people. Like I felt completely accepted. I felt completely safe in this environment with all these people that look like they could be my aunties or uncles or grandma, grandpa. And I happened to be a roommate with uh, this young woman named Marissa, and we became partners. And we started Japanese American Memorial Pilgrimages. And our original idea was to film oral histories at the different pilgrimages, um, and also just film what the campsites look today. And it's kind of grown more into this um, video filming of multi-generations. So it's not just an oral history of a survivor. It's actually them telling their story with their family sitting around them. So Jan, uh, we were very lucky that a couple of years ago, we got a National Park Service grant, a Japanese American Confinement Sites grant to be able to travel to these um, different pilgrimages. And um, I would like to show a really quick video of ours that will kind of help anyone who has not been on a pilgrimage before understand why they're important. And it's more than just a historical learning experience. It's, um, you learn a lot just about yourself. And so this video that we're, I'm going to show is an auntie and her nephew who uh, were at Minidoka in 2017. I think that's when we filmed them and, uh, Teiko, who is the auntie, was born there, and she lost her mother there. And so she was able to go back, attend the pilgrimage, and she wanted somebody in her family to go with her. So her nephew, Spencer, decided to be that person. It's different when you actually are in place. You can read all the books you want, see all the pictures you want, but you're not going to get the actual experience until you come down here. I wanted to fill in a lot of the blanks that my father didn't provide because he was too young or just didn't want to talk to me about the events that happened. You know, that's what it's about. Tell your stories so that the healing can really get on its way. It's a feeling. You, you can smell it, you can breathe it. And you're sharing, you're sharing it with other people that want to experience the same thing. Yeah. A date which will live in infamy. The United States of America was suddenly and deliberately attacked by naval and air forces of the Empire of Japan. 120,000 persons of Japanese ancestry were transported to an assembly center where they lived for months, eventually being transferred to one of 10 relocation centers. For me, it was coming down here and just experiencing with sights and sounds and just your senses of what it's really like down here. Can you imagine when they didn't have any coal, they came out and got this stuff? Yeah, that's true. They when the when they're late on the it. shipment. Well, for me, it was really important that another member of my family have this experience that I did, and Spencer's the one that said, "I'm I'm going to go," and I was just thrilled that somebody else would know 
what I experienced when I was here. I felt more of a connection actually being on the grounds and seeing the markers and the buildings my dad and my aunt and my grandfather and grandmother would have passed that I'm, I'm passing that same path. So I can take that experience and show my son and my grandson, if my father was willing to talk about it, you know, try to extract that information from him. It's, it's kind of difficult, but if I had my son there, then it's a little bit easier so he can kind of channel that towards my son. Cause I know some things, but my son doesn't know. And coming from my father is a lot better than coming from me. Family is very important to me and mm -hmm. um, to share that experience with her um, and get more knowledge from her and answers that I couldn't get from my dad. I have your brother, I mean, your father and me on the railing of one of the um, barracks. This is, as he mentioned, really a community because of our shared experience and that it seemed like we instantly connected and I felt I could trust other people with my stories because they had similar stories to mine. And so for me, it was a real sense of belonging and feeling welcomed. And I know that these are people that surrounded my parents when they were here in the camp. And that's probably why they, you know, did as well as they did because they had loving people around them who were helping them as well. A photographer was one of the newspapers saw us there and he took a photo of my uncle tracked him down. So that we, and that's the only picture I have of my mom and I. I have a little um, doll that my mother made out of elastic and beads. And she stuck it all together for a little doll yeah, for yeah. me to play with. Yeah, so I'm so going to say. Did she die in camp? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Appendicitis. Oh. She got an infection from a ruptured appendix. In camp? In camp. And oh. so how old were you at the time? I was one. And she was 35. Oh. Yeah. I really had a real sense of place and that it was almost a sacred place because she was here. And I finally understood what the last three years of her life were like. And I could really appreciate that she had to love me a lot to get me through those first years, that first year, because now I know we lost so many babies um, and she herself lost her life. For me, you know, I've never been able to let my mother go because um, because I was holding on to trying to figure out who she was and searching for that. And coming here uh, began the healing process and being able to let my mother go because I finally, I felt like her spirit was around me and that that was all I really needed. And so this trip, I really felt like, you know, this was really the healing um, process at work. And to have Spencer join me was just so exciting because then he would understand what makes his aunt work. And that, you know, this was something he would really understand now because of what it meant to me, you know, to have that connection with my mom for the first time in my life. And I had waited way too long to have this experience. So when I finally came, I was 72 years old. And it was like, oh, my God, I should have done this 100 years ago mm -hmm. so that I could have made this connection with my mom much sooner and, and be at peace with her death. I asked my father if he wanted to come and experience the pilgrimage. Um, and he was shaking his head no. And... Uh, <laughs> I just wanted to share this experience with me because <laughs> I wish you'd come with me.
you know, this was a very emotional journey for me. And I still have, a, as you can tell, I have a very hard time talking about it. But, but you know, I have, I'm more at peace with, with my family and what had happened to them during the incarceration than I was before I came here. You know, that's what it's about, to tell your story so that the healing can really get on its way. And I think that's what it did for me. You can read all the books. You can look at all the videos and stuff that you want, but it's different when you actually are in place. It's a feeling, you, you can smell it, you can breathe it. And you're sharing, you're sharing it with other people that want to experience the same thing. Yeah. You know, this is really a very special place. And um, so coming back was like coming home. So, you know, I'm really glad I did this. Thank you so much for that video. I think that gives us a really powerful idea of the value of pilgrimages um, for every single individual and more about what drives the work you do. So looping back to Tadaima or the virtual pilgrimage, um, can you just give us a little bit more information about the whole genesis of that idea and how that kind of unfolded? Yeah, so um, I actually, a couple of years ago, started doing a pilgrimage to, to the two camps in Arkansas, Jerome and Rower. And my pilgrimage is kind of first up in the in the calendar year, um, usually happens in April. And obviously this year, uh, early April was when COVID really started to be serious. And I had to make the hard decision of being the first pilgrimage to, to cancel because I just did not want to risk anybody's health, any elders' health. So I canceled, and then it was just kind of like a domino effect. So all of the in-person pilgrimages were canceled. And after about the third one that canceled, I just thought, we can't go a whole year without something. It's just not... I mean, for the elders, um, you know, you can't just say, oh, okay, next year it'll be fine, or in six months it'll be fine, because, you know, nothing is guaranteed. And and they are by far the best part about a pilgrimage. And so I just thought, well, maybe we can do this online. And it was kind of a wacky, crazy idea, and I wasn't thinking of it being nine weeks for sure, but I thought that we could focus on all of the different camps, and each campsite could could show what their site looks like today and encourage more people to go visit. And Hanako being part of National Park Service and Minidoka, um, I, I don't know how it came about. I think I just mentioned to her on the phone, I was like, yeah, I kind of had this idea, you know, but whatever, it's it's crazy. And she was like, oh, I'll, I'll help you. And I thought, uh, okay, let's do it. And that that happened in, I want to say, late March. And then we actually premiered on June 13th. So that was, that's what happened. And it just ballooned into this big thing where originally it was going to be kind of small and maybe just a week long. And then it got to nine weeks long because we kind of, as a group, like the 16 of us that were brainstorming behind the scenes, just kind of thought, hey, you know what? Virtually, you can do almost anything. So let's do our, our fantasy pilgrimage. Let's get speakers that are fantasy speakers and, and tell stories of the lesser known sites like the DOJ camps and things like that. And so it just got to this really big thing that was amazing. And, you know, it turned out so much better than we even imagined and everybody seemed to really enjoy it and um here is a clip from our closing ceremony that kind of uh shows a little highlight from our different sessions and um i hope everybody gets a 
kind of a better idea of what this project was after watching this 10 minute clip. Um, so we are so grateful for your time and your energy and that was captivating. Nice Just meeting you, Fujiko. Nice okay. to meet you. Good to be with you. Great to be with you. Art world and the world in general has evolved um, and kind of in terms of how, how we're looking at dance. Richard Yada says hello from Arkansas. Hi, Richard. Hi, Richard. He's so, a great guy. For the interest, I'm a historian, so I like to do things as historically accurately as possible. So I have procured a old-fashioned rotary theater for this part of this. Oh, this smells so good. How does that look? good, huh? John did not get the memo about wearing a white shirt for Class Picture Day, because that's him in the dark shirt and bolo tie. That's here that he makes two lifelong friends, Roy Kumasaka and Frank Ishida. It was a, a terrible time in our lives, but the, 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 for teenagers like us, one of the things that was good about camp was we, I was just getting interested in girls. So there are lots of girls. And my mom was nine. So um, they, they were little. Uh, my, for my mom, uh, she remembers crying. She says she remembers crying the first night and, and keeping everybody in the barracks awake because she was crying. Um, and even incarcerated behind barbed wires, they never forgot that dream. I don't think they ever lost confidence in the principles of America. And they pass that on to us in our daily lives. When you suppress or oppress any group of people, you are really interrogating, interrogating the rights of all people. Their suffering or pain unfairly imposed upon anyone. It's my duty, it's your duty. Try to alleviate it because that's the way we gain a better life for all of us. So this ability to work with our volunteers through Zoom and other StreamYard and other chats has actually allowed us to learn so much more about them. So we're so great. Well, we're not grateful that COVID-19 happened, but that is the silver lining. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you so much for the opportunity. I hope people enjoy the stories. Uh, these are, you know, very important because these stories really, as you say, uh, tell us who we are. I'm so thrilled to be able to perform and present for this Nikkei Black Party. Also want to shout you all out. Thank you, um, wherever you are tuning in from, for tuning in, for joining the movement. Uh, via live stream and I hope that you all will continue to keep in touch even beyond this virtual space. Hello again, I'm David Ono. And I'm Tamlin Tamita. We are back at the Japanese American National Museum because, unfortunately, we have come to the end of Tadaima, a community virtual pilgrimage. We hope that you have all enjoyed this nine-week celebration and that it has helped you feel more connected with our Nikkei community through these extraordinary times. Altogether, nearly 100,000 viewers have tuned in with large populations centered in Hawaii, the West Coast, and the Northeast. Others have participated from as far away as Japan, Brazil, Australia, the United Kingdom. But regardless of where we are, we hope that all Nikkei feel inspired to tell their story. Overall, the virtual pilgrimage has been an incredible feat, bringing together more than 350 programs from 65 organizations in just a matter of weeks. We've heard from scholars and camp survivors, enjoyed live performances, taken virtual tours, and made gardens inspired by archaeology. There's so much of this history to learn about, and now we have even more materials to guide all of us. The vast majority of these programs will remain on the Japanese American Memorial Pilgrimage website for you to return to. So even though this event has come to a close, the spirit of Tadaima can still live on. Thank you, Kimiko. So Hanako, this was an unprecedented event for the National Park Service in terms of the scale, the duration, and the level of community engagement. 
So I was wondering if you could give us some perspective from the National Park Service side of things. Um, what does community-led programming look like to you? Why was it something that you were willing to prioritize? And what was the impact for you and your programs in terms of the virtual pilgrimage? Absolutely. Well, I'll cover that in uh, my PowerPoint presentation that I'll just start right now. Um, so with Tadaima, a community virtual pilgrimage, we were able to um, basically put together a large multi-week program in a very short amount of time to kind of engage the, um, the visitors in learning more about the Japanese American incarceration history. So Mia actually wanted me to kind of do a brief overview about the Japanese American incarceration, because I'm not sure if all of you are familiar with this story or not. But this map here, you'll see that there are so many sites that are associated with the Japanese American incarceration, where we have some of the main camps, which are indicated by those uh, 10 triangles that you'll see at Tule Lake, Manzanar, Minidoka, Topaz, Grenada, Rower, Jerome, Gila, and Poston. Those are all what we normally call the you know, main war relocation authority camps. But there's a lot of other associated sites that you see there. And one of the great things about Tadaima was that we were able to kind of focus on some of these smaller sites to tell the story of those who are incarcerated. So basically during World War II, the US government was forcibly removing people of Japanese ancestry off the West Coast. And it was actually due to, you know, kind of civil liberties and civil rights violations due to racism. That people wanted to exclude them because they were fearful. The government was fearful, but it was actually later on in the uh, 1980s deemed that there was actually no military necessity. And it was due to um, race prejudice, war hysteria, and a failure of political leadership. So um, with that in mind, when we kind of talk about this history, it's part of our collective history. And we need to recognize that, that, you know, this is where we had civil liberties violations, where we forced people, you know, to, you know, out of their homes. We basically stifled people's civil liberties, civil rights, stripped them of their dignity. And they were basically left holding, you know, whatever pieces of their lives to rebuild because most folks were incarcerated, you know, between like a year to three years. And then at the end of the war, we're given $25 and a one-way ticket uh, to go rebuild their lives. So what we wanted to do was to tell this story in a very, um, in a more holistic way that contextualized the story. Not that this story started with the attack on Pearl Harbor and ended when the last camp closed, but to contextualize it where we as the United States forced open Japan and started the immigration process, those anti-Asian sentiment that existed um, specifically against the Chinese that led to mass immigration of Japanese nationals coming in, but there were laws that prevented Japanese nationals from becoming um, um, naturalized citizens. And it wasn't just uh, for Japanese nationals, it was for um, you know, most Asians, um, but their American born children were able to be US citizens, but yet their civil liberties and civil rights were pushed aside for this notion of military necessity, which again, I mentioned uh, was not um, a reality. And so one of the things that we need to recognize is that a majority of the people who are incarcerated, so um, they were American citizens. So over the course of the duration of these uh, camps, 110,000 people were forcibly removed from their homes but there was an additional like about 10,000 children who were born in camp. So then you hear that there was about 120,000 people who were incarcerated. So that's where you hear the two different numbers and it's because of the like how it was qualified. So a majority of the people who were incarcerated were actually children, um, which we don't really talk about too much. But so that's basically what we were doing was to just capture this history to tell a more holistic view kind of from immigration to um, what has occurred since redress. And you can see that there's a picture down at the bottom right of uh, President Reagan signing the Civil Liberties Act of 1988. Um, but one of the best quotes that um, one of my mentors uh, have is at the bottom where it says, you know, this is not just a Japanese American story, but American story with implications for the world. And it's really true because, you know, we need to make sure that we don't forget this story. So we remember that we need to treat others, you know, as we want to be treated. So kind of moving forward to um, Minidoka National Historic Site and the Tadaima programming, one of the things um, that interested us at Minidoka was that, you know, we have a very small site with limited staff. 
you know, we don't have a lot of staff that could create content. So when Kimiko actually reached out to me to uh, participate in this program, we're trying to figure out how, how are we going to do this? You know, how could we, you know, potentially like crowdsource all this material? Because I know I can create content and um, we know that other people, you know, can't create a lot of content. So we were trying to figure out what currently exists out there and where are um, the information um, like being stored so we could reach out to people. And there was a lot of new content that was created for this program, which is pretty incredible. But at Minidoka, you know, with our limited staff, you know, we really uh, prize partnerships in our programming. So it helps us with capacity issues. So, um, you know, outside of Tadaima, you know, we work with uh, Friends of Minidoka, Minidoka Pilgrimage Planning Committee, the Japanese American Museum of Oregon, Wing Loop Museum, and other in institutions. Um, and a lot of that is because when we could combine our powers, we have more capacity to do things, whether it's teachers' workshops or just going out to uh, represent our organizations at events. So that's why, you know, we prioritize these partnership programs. And this is why Tadaima was very, uh, a very unique program that was something that we wanted to help out with. So this uh, leads to our community engagement aspects where when Kimiko and I started to try to design what was this program gonna look like, you know, originally we we're thinking it was gonna be something a lot smaller, but then we're like, you know what, we could kind of go big or go home. And so we had to create a strategy for a coalition. We realized we need to have a coalition uh, to kind of come together to support this initiative, but how are we gonna get the right partners to join? And so we did have a really, you know, robust conversation to make sure that we have like the main stakeholder organizations invited and part of this conversation. There was a lot of outreach that was done because initially like Kimiko came up with this idea and I can't remember, it was like March 25th. And by April like 6th, we already had a core group that was created because we decided, hey, we can't do this by ourselves. We need to make sure we reach out to other community leaders. And from there, we kind of created our steering committee. And once we got our steering committee together to help actually push the project through and the programming and helping out with all the logistical stuff, then um, we're like, okay, we need to start building the other coalitions of partnerships, you know, whether it's going to be other museum institutions, um, whether big or small or other organizations like news outlets and whatnot. So a lot of that we had to just you know, kind of figure out how are we going to organize and um, create this, you know, I guess pitch to try to get as many people together as possible, you know. And the other thing is with this crowdsourcing um, aspect of content is that, you know, there's a lot of organizations out there that I learned about firsthand through this program that I didn't know about before, you know. Um, like, I didn't really know too much about Mukai Farms or the Wakamatsu Silk Colony, like um, it was a great opportunity to get a lot of these smaller organizations to kind of um, get, you know, get more awareness and elevating the organizations for the general public. So, you know, we found a common goal of education and the pilgrimage, um, just kind of like, you know, because, because of that void that the pilgrimage left, you know, I think that was kind of the rallying call, right? And so we were able to, you know, put together this incredible program um, with a whole bunch of content providers um, that I think provided a positive impact to the community because I still hear people talking about it today. So the last thing I kind of want to talk about is some of the statistics that we have. So again, you know, this was a nine week program, 65 days long. We had over 100,000 participants over 70 par or about 70 partners and 30, uh, 43 sites represented. And that's kind of going back to that other map that I had earlier on. Let me try to get to that really quick. Um, so it's 43 of these sites were represented um, in our program, which is pretty incredible. So um, let's go back to my last slide, sorry. Um, but anyways, you know, we had about 368 programs or so, if I counted it correctly, we had about 46 states represented uh, represented and participating with 71 countries around the world. So, um, you know, we're still seeing people are using it as a resource. 
there, um, we actually have Brown University. Uh, one of their faculty members is using this as part of uh, her class to teach her students about the Japanese American incarceration. So, you know, at the time, I don't think that we realized, but you know, this is now probably the largest secondary repository or secondary resource repository for um, this subject matter. And it's pretty cool that we're able to be a part of it. Um, and, you know, honestly, uh, this was just really powerful, um, at least within uh, in the park service uh, realm, where we don't necessarily have the best relationships with communities of color. But being able to partner with um, the Japanese American Memorial Pilgrimage and our other coalition partners um, to, to do this was really great because it was an opportunity to provide communities of color their own voice in telling the story in a meaningful way where it isn't just, oh, the government's going to be interpreting this in however way we think it is, you know, because there's still like this, this misunderstanding that sometimes people think that the government's continuing to present propaganda. But, you know, as a public historian, I really want to make sure that we're doing justice when we're telling the story, but to allow the community to come together and, and present the history was super powerful. And I'm just so glad I was a part of it. So that's basically it. All right. Welcome back. Hi, Kimiko and Hanako. Thank you so much. It was so great to look back on what was accomplished this summer with Tadaima and also to see Hanako that it's being given a second life now and being used as a resource for folks. Um, it did make me miss that community aspect that we enjoyed in the program, um, but it's great to see a lot of familiar faces with us here today in the chat. So welcome everyone. Thanks for joining us. Um, so now we have a better look um, at behind the scenes, you know, what all it took for you both to pull off this nine week program. Um, I do have some questions for you to get a little bit more into the nitty gritty of how you organized all of these moving pieces. Um, but I do wanna encourage questions from the audience. So as a reminder for viewers, if you're joining us now, please feel free to drop those in the chat. Um, if you're joining us through the NCPH, please let us know if you have any questions about digital programming, um, and if you joined us for Tadaima this summer and you have any burning questions about the behind the scenes aspects for Hanako and Kimiko, please feel free to drop those as well. And we'll try to get to as many as we can. Um, but I first wanna start with understanding your framework for delivering so much content. How did you organize um, telling, you know, a hundred years of a Japanese American story in nine weeks? So what was your framework for delivering so much information? Well, I guess I'll, I'll take that because, you know, originally Kim, Kimiko only wanted like a, what was, was it, 10 days or one week thing? And then I was just like, well, let me kind of think about how I would like to present history. And if I had all the time in the world, how would I like to do it? And so I broke it out into themes, you know, again, taking that holistic approach from basically um, immigration to what happened afterwards. So a lot of it was kind of themes that, you know, even um, Mia, you and I have discussed over the years um, about all the many research topics that we would like to go about um, and, and research on. So I kind of took, you know, that framework and, you know, we just kind of built out the nine week program to be like, how could we really incorporate all these stories to tell this more holistic story, right? That people are able to actually understand this, but then in a manner that isn't so overwhelming, even though yes, it was very overwhelming because we had so much programming, but then also trying to find those like um, stories that haven't been told a lot. Like um, the one thing that I really want to make sure was in there was the incarceration abroad because not a lot of people know about that. Great. Anything to add, Kimiko? I, I think just also in the, the thinking behind telling the story, um, a lot of times documentaries and other resources will start on Pearl Harbor, the bombing of Pearl Harbor. And we just wanted to make it, make a have very clear foundation of, you know, the, there were lots of events that led up to this and it wasn't just, you know, December 7th on. And, and so we just wanted to try to, to give people that background so that they understand that, you know, as we all sh 
should understand history doesn't occur in a vacuum. There are things that happen that lead up to other things happening. Yeah, great point. Okay, so I think everyone was really, um, you know, folks that were part of the planning, I think we were all so surprised that this really had legs and reached as many people as it did. I think every week we saw our like numbers of folks being reached grow. And I think it was all exciting and astonishing for some of us. Um, so reaching an audience of that scale, how did you think outside of the box to reach new audiences? And what tips do you have for other folks in terms of um, promoting their programs to audiences, you know, globally and of all different generations like you guys did? Um, yeah, sorry, I'll just go. <laughs> um, I think a lot of it is just partnership, 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 because that's the thing. It's like not having the capacity or maybe the mailing list um, that may be as robust because, you know, a lot of the stuff that we do at Minidoka, we have a very specific demographic of folks, right? So creating that coalition to build it out and to get everyone to like promote it, I think was really helpful to just you know, get that really, really wide net of folks. Um, also, I think that reaching out to different age groups, um, now predominantly through our YouTube channel and using social media like Facebook, we, we definitely um, got kind of the, the, the Sansei crowd, which would be, you know, third generation, but we wanted to reach younger folks as well who might not be as familiar with the story. So we had our Nikkei Rising group, which um, is about, I think there might be about 10 um, folks in their early 20s that are, you know, doing a lot of work still uh, trying to get the story told in, in a way that they find accessible and hopefully other young people find accessible. Um, and then also just using other social media like Instagram and, um, you know, things like that. I think you just have to kind of go in the areas that that have the people that you want to reach. And so we were really trying with email and everything else. We were really just trying to reach as many people as possible to get them to watch. And then once they watched, I think that is also why we try to, to use so many different types of programming, not just academic lectures, but also artists, photographers, singers, dancers, because, you know, I think using different ways or having different ways of interpreting a story is also really important for trying to, to understand more, you know, whole picture, but also to help people um, access. So not everybody is interested in, in attending a lecture, but somebody might be interested in watching a movie or they might be interested in listening to somebody perform a song that they wrote or a poem. Um, so that's why we tried to, to have as many different types of programming to get as many different people interested. And, and I, I think the other thing too, is like, as we were building our partnership and coalition, we utilized people's skill sets, like, and their interests. So it's like, we had artists go find artists. Like, you know, why would you want a historian to go find artists? You know, we, you know, even had our vegetation manager, you know, do some um, gardening, you know, tips and stuff like that. Cause, you know, Kimiko and I was trying to strategize, like, you know, again, with its content, like what type of content could grab people. Right. And then so once we start to figure that out, things kind of fell in place with people's interests from like the different institutions um, that that were helping out. Yeah, I think my main takeaway there is there were so many points of entry. Um, mm -hmm. You know, you kind of just had all sorts of offerings so people could really pick what appealed to them. Um, so that's great. Yeah, so pick and choose your adventure. That was kind of what I, I was telling Kimiko when we're, we're starting this, where it's like, you know, I remember those books as a kid and it's like, you know what, you, you may find something that you may have not noticed. Like a lot of the theatrical stuff that we had on the Nikkei uh, block party was, you know, really cool because I'm not necessarily an artsy person and I was able to, you know, get better understanding and appreciation for the different types of artwork, you know, because I wanted to support my friends who were, you know, helping out with that program. So it exposed me to a lot of new things as well. But then also, I just I do have to give a shout out to, to Clement and Emily because they uh, from Janum because they did this really outside of the box type of uh, thing segment where Emily, who's read 
all of the camp newspapers, which I don't know how many years that took you to do, Emily, but oh my God. Um, and she actually made a recipe from the Topaz Times, like literally made it. And it, to me, it was just an even different way to think about history. I mean, one thing that that was just interesting to me about that that recipe was, you know, it said, put it outside your window. And I think that really drove home to me. It's like, oh, they're writing this, like, put this outside your window during the winter time in Utah because it's going to freeze. Like this is, and, and so it just makes you see the history in just a, a completely different way, which I thought was really awesome and, and outside of the box. So, so kudos to Emily and Clement. Yeah, you guys did great. All right. Um, I'm seeing a lot of great questions come in the chat. So thank you, keep them coming. I just have a couple more I'd like to get to here. Um, kind of along the lines of reaching every audience in terms of who we wanted to draw in. Um, I think a big part of that is also, we had people creating content across all of these um, skill sets and age ranges and generations. So I, I wonder if there were any hiccups in getting everyone engaged in content creation and how you were able to streamline, streamline that so it wasn't intimidating for folks to create content maybe for the first time um, and what your kind of best practices are that you arrived at by the end of the nine weeks? Um, I think that we were trying to be as inclusive as possible. So we know that there are different skill sets out there and not everybody is able to film something. So we, we didn't really put a requirement like, oh, it has to look this way or you need to use these graphics or it has to be, you know, and if somebody needed help, um, you know, we edited for them. So, uh, you know, for instance, like Wakamatsu uh, Tea and Silk Colony, they did some really amazing filming out there with a drone and, and everything, but they just didn't have the, the tools to edit. And so I edited that for them. And, um, you know, same with a couple of other institutions. And it was kind of just a win-win situation. It, it's like, oh, thank you for creating this content. We'll help you do it. And, and so I think that it it's just not wanting to limit somebody, you know, if, if they say, hey, all I, I all I really feel comfortable doing is doing a PowerPoint in Zoom, great, perfect, you know, it's it's fine, because there what we didn't have an expectation on how it should look, just that they we were just happy that they were willing to participate. Yeah, and I guess to add to that is like, you know, shout out to Danny who helped out, who's a volunteer over at Tula Lake National um the uh, monument, um, he helped us out with editing. And a lot of it um, also was like, we did training as well. So we had a fellow um, at Minidoka National Historic Site. Her name is Erin Aoyama. Um, she would actually like set up like either Zoom meetings or uh, record people in StreamYard um, just to help out um, and then train them as well. You know, even some of our elders for our elder sessions, you know, she would go through and try to get them all situated. And we also created some little graphics and stuff because you know, some of those clips, um, like in the opening or closing ceremony, like we're trying to teach, you know, 70, 80 year olds how to record on their phone. So we had these, you know, little graphics that's like, this is what you do. Um, and then they're able to, you know, do it and send it to us, whether it was through text or email. So, you know, we just try to be as accommodating as possible, um, which, you know, in a weird way, it's almost like a time capsule of its time, you know, right? Because we're in COVID, you know, not everyone could just like go out and get like, a 4K camera to record themselves, so, yeah. I just wanna give a quick shout out to um, the demographic spread, Kimiko. I don't know if you can think of that at the top of your head, but we had a tremendous amount of folks joining us who were like in the 80s and 90s age range. Oh yeah, I think we had, well, that were actually registered. I think we had at least 30 people who were in their 90s, which, is super exciting and, and so glad to be able to reach out to that demographic also. And on the other end, we had the Nikkei Rising, like college students who are creating amazing content, um, doing podcasts and um, they had this whole other platform they were using. <laughs> I'm showing my age by not knowing the name of the platform. <laughs> oh, Discord. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know anything about it either. <laughs> but yeah, they're, they're they're still doing a lot, and they like they're doing some social events as well. And the, and then they just had a video up on their YouTube channel um, where they had two members that were actually doing drawing on a whiteboard, kind of the basic history of 
Japanese immigration to the United States. I thought, oh, that was really interesting. So yeah, they're doing lots of stuff. That's great. All right, do you have any tips or lessons learned to public historians who are hoping to engage more with digital programming who might be intimidated to start? My, I guess my only thing is just like lean in, try whatever, like don't be afraid to fail because we are already in the year 2020 and it's been chaotic. So like, just try it out, see if it'll go anywhere. Um, and then, you know, even like, again, it's all about partnerships and who you're willing to reach out to and collaborate with. Cause you know, we also had a really great collaboration with Saga and Amelia, right? Where, you know, gathering all these oral histories from some elders and even some of the virtual pilgrimage participants to capture this history. You know, so um, there's other ways to do it than just like, oh, let's record something and put it online. It's like you could create other things um, like our digital archives that we have, which is kind of cool and um, some of the other programs. So. Yeah, I just said I, I agree with Hanako. Just just do whatever, you know, comes to your head and, and it may not turn out the way that you you imagined because i know that we had some hiccups along the way we had some technical issues and and tech technology is hard that's what i tried to to impart to our our pilgrims you know because we would get some complaints about you know ha being able to surf the web or being able to to hear on the live broadcast and and it's hard you know um it's it's a learning process too for us so um it definitely you're gonna probably make some mistakes, but it's fine. That's what you learn from and you just keep going. And I think most people just accept, I think they're just happy to have the information. And 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 again, also what Hanako said to, if you just engage people in different ways also, that is more outside of the box, that is more different than just, you know, talking a lecture, you know, because sometimes people are more visual learners. And so you might want to try to engage them with slides or with, you know, something that's basic, but it's just a different way that it helps people learn and absorb the story and get them interested. Because th I think the point is, do you get them interested in the story? And then hopefully they'll just go off and do their own research, you know, follow their own um, interest of that, of that particular uh, history that you're trying to teach them. And I, I guess I just would like to put a positive spin on this. It's like, you know, Yes, don't be afraid to fail, but you may be pleasantly surprised because like, did we ever think that we're gonna get 100,000 participants watching our content? Did we even think we're gonna have more than 100 programs? You know, it, it ballooned out because there was so much interest and people wanted to provide um, their content because they recognized, wow, this is a different platform that is reaching a different audience. And just being open to just you know, working with people and figuring out, you know, it's kind of cool because there's other opportunities to maybe replicate this in the future, um, you know, especially if it works for you. I just want to point out, you know, the volume of information and programs that came out of Tadaima. Uh, the vast majority, with the exception of the film festival, because there were limited programming run times for a lot of the films, the majority of it is still available on the Japanese American Memorial Pilgrimages website and in their YouTube channel, which you're here now. Um, so please feel free. I know there's probably hundreds of programs I still haven't even caught up on. There's just so much out there. Um, so if you're even interested in a certain topic, please check it out. There's so much to look at, so much to learn from. It's really amazing. Yeah, and then, sorry, I wanna say one last thing, because this was definitely, you know, if we qualify it within COVID, you know, the largest National Park Service um, online program that, you know, occurred. And I don't even know, like, if we could even, if we should even qualify it, because I don't know if there's anything as large as this that we've done that, you know, had this much programming for this amount of weeks. So, shout out to you all for making it happen. Thanks, Kimiko. Okay. <laughs> no, no. Kimiko, but Hanako, please feel free to jump in after as well. But something that came up when we were discussing um, doing this program specifically for NCPH. Um, Kimiko, is that you'd never thought of yourself as a public historian. You approached all of this work as first a documentary filmmaker um, and then, you know, pilgrimage junkie. And so I wondered if you have any 
um, insight for public historians on how to connect with people they might not traditionally think of working with, either in terms of partnerships or audiences, um, because this virtual pilgrimage is definitely a public history program. So I just wonder if you've come to terms with that at all. I think there there is kind of an imposter syndrome going on with me that, uh, you know, because I don't have like a PhD or I'm not an academic, that therefore what I do is not as, I don't want to say not as valid, but just not, I don't, I don't know, like it doesn't seem like a historian is the right um, word for me. But I think that definitely one thing that I tried to do is again by reaching out to different types of of people reaching out to you know we re having people do cooking segments for instance uh, our host of sunday supper here mia but uh i i think it it it's i'm still trying to wrap my brain around it but i do feel like having uh like learning history is not just dates and names you know there's so much more to it that Everybody, I mean, history is made of human beings. That's all of us. We are all part of history. So it's not like it should be excluded to one group of people who just happen to go to school for many years to learn about a specific subject. You know, we all can have it. We all have a part to play in it. And so it's just having to like tap into how that particular um, person fits into that history. And I hope that our, our history that we, you know, talk about even though it is specifically Japanese American, it is also American history. And actually we, like Hanako said, we had Canadian history, we had some Australian history, we had some South American history in there too. I mean, the incarceration happened all over the world. So it like affected, it affects everybody it, it, in different ways. And so I hope that other people found it accessible and that we were not trying to um, exclude anybody from it. And I think that by telling stories um, like with Spencer and Teiko, um, who, hi Spencer, um, by the way, is like there are, that is like one of our most popular videos. And I think what it is, is it allows people to empathize and to be in that space with them to, to understand how painful this history can be, even if it didn't happen to you or your family. So I, I, I don't know. I, I I don't know if I'm even answering your question, but as far as like me being a, a public historian, no. But I think that reaching out to other people, um, other people who document history in whatever way, whether it's song, poetry, film, whatever, um, I think that 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 is a way to give more a well-rounded um, story. Hanako, any tips on? Um working with unlikely public historians? Um, again, it's just like, get to know people because you're gonna find people that have skill sets that you may not initially connect with. And then, you know, they could help out, you know, um, and they could do incredible work, you know, whether it's just like helping out with graphics or just like helping organize on the back end because of all this content. Like there was so much data that we had to gather, whether it's like, their bio, headshot, title, blurb, you know, there's people in the world who are really good at those admin things, you know, it's just make sure you're just not um, pigeonholing yourself thinking, okay, there's a silo of history and we just need to stick there, you know, because history, like, you know, there's different ways to make this history come alive. And it's just recognizing the different talents that you need, you know, because we definitely needed the editors with the videos, you know, um, we, we needed a web person, which mostly was Kimiko. <laughs> um, and so like, those are the things where it's like, you could help, um, like if you're gonna be crowdsourcing for such a large program, you know, you, you could try to build a coalition with the skill sets that are needed to be successful. And then inadvertently making them a public historian without them knowing it. Um, and I guess one thing I, I just need to mention is that this was crazy big, you know, our idea, you know, from conception to completion was only 15 weeks. So we only got six weeks lead in before our first program. But by the time we're actually trying to like build out that program, we only had a few weeks lead time. So we were literally building this as we're going. 
you know, and trying to figure it out because again, there was so much interest that more people wanted to provide content and I was trying to manage all that. So, you know, we were just trying to bring in other volunteers or other interns to help support uh, the need to just organize it all. So just look in other areas um, for assistance. That would be my tip. Perfect. Before we go to some of our um, audience questions, I just want to ask if you both have anything that you're working on, what you're planning next um, that you'd like to plug? Yeah, and I guess that this could maybe uh, go to I see NCPH uh, post this question, which I'm not going to talk about to Daima, so I'll let uh, Kimiko do that. But now I'm in my acting role over at um, Pearl Harbor National Memorial, and I don't know if Kimiko could put up the graphic or not, but I got this crazy idea that I should do a two and a half day program. And uh, we're calling it Beyond Pearl Harbor, um, uh, the untold stories of World War II. So essentially we're kind of modeling it off of Tadaima. And um, it's, you know, two and a half day program. We got um, essentially a opening ceremony that's gonna start on December 4th. And then we're gonna have two days of educational programming where there's going to be videos that are just dropped on a website and uh, people could watch those. So it's going to be probably between 30 and 50 uh, programs. And then we do have live components where there's going to be eight live sessions where we're trying to integrate um, other National Park Service sites telling World War II history because this is actually the 75th anniversary of the ending of World War II. And I just wanted to diversify the stories that we're telling while showcasing the National Park Service as well. And we will also have a, film, a virtual film festival. And then it would lead into the um, virtual December 7th uh, Remembrance Day programming on December 7th. So. Oh, uh, yeah. and Jam, <laughs> sorry. Uh, and Jam, we are um, actually planning on something fun. So we're gonna do a holiday special on the 27th, assuming that most people will not be out shopping for Black Friday and, and staying safe at home. And so we're gonna just have some fun segments with some crafting and we're gonna have some some singing. Kanji returns, Kanji and friends returns for some, uh, yes, for some uh, caroling. And Erin Ayama has promised to do a song. So we will have her singing. And then we also have a lot of cooking segments and some crafting. So it's gonna be fun, so everybody should tune in. Great, we can't wait for that. All right, um, we have a question from NCPH. Do you anticipate doing this again next year considering COVID still isn't under control? So what are the plans for 2021? Um, so we have uh, JAMP uh, has applied for a, a JAX grant, Japanese American Confinement Sites grant to be able to do Tadaima 2. Um, if we are able to get that grant, it will probably be in the summertime of next year. So we're looking at the fall for Tadaima, and it most likely will not be nine weeks. It'll probably be more like four weeks um, because we feel like we've laid the foundation down with the history. And so now with the with the, uh, Tadaima 2, we can really dig into more of the lesser known stories and maybe talk a little bit more about intergenerational trauma and, and the effects of the incarceration. Um, and so hopefully we will get that grant and then we can actually um, pay people to do some of the things because the only way, and I will have to say this, that we were able to pull off to Daima this year is that so many people donated their time, donated their resources, donated their content, for free or for very little money. And so we definitely want to be able to compensate people for that next time. Um, and that's really the, the goal for, for the next virtual pilgrimage. Okay, we have a- And it won't be as long, right? I said it would be four weeks maybe instead of nine. So it'd be half as long. Yeah. But the Park Service will always be a partner um, in this endeavor. So. Great. Wait, we have a question from Madeline. Did you adapt programming as you went in response to feedback? And what what were some of the ways you made space for community engagement? What would you do differently if you're doing it all again? So those are actually three great questions. 
So how did you adapt in response to feedback? I, I, most of the feedback was positive. Uh, I, I mean, really the only feedback that, that we got that um, we'll obviously try to do in the future, but we were unable to do during Tadima was, uh, you know, just technical glitches, or I know people were very frustrated that we didn't have a full schedule out, but we were literally planning things like the day before it was going to go up and it just, it wasn't, it, we just weren't able to do any kind of planning like that. But next time, since we'll hopefully have at least, you know, two or three months to plan ahead, we can have that so that people will be a little bit more um, knowledgeable of when things are going to happen and not just find out from an email, you know, like, oh, two days from now, there's a live session, just just so you know. Um, I think those were the biggest issues that uh, people had. And, you know, we will definitely try to fix them for the next time. Well, and it seems like, you know, Kimiko, you guys are, you know, looking at different types of technology to help with that. And so far, like, we haven't seen a lot of, or at least on my end, haven't seen a lot of glitching uh, this time because I think, you know, with, as technology is evolving with this new norm, I think that people are recognizing, oh, we need to kind of figure things out and the technology is catching up or we're catching up to it, you know, whatever it is. So um, yeah, it's, it's exciting though. You know. Okay, um, Hanako, how about what were some ways you made space for community engagement? Yeah, I think, um, I don't know. Well, I think one of the ways is like when people were just kind of um, some of the feedback that I was getting, you know, they're asking for the space to tell their, you know, whatever story that they're trying to preserve and offering that to them was like definitely like the low hanging fruit where it's like, oh, we have the platform that people see value in and just saying, hey, yeah, sure. Let's see how we can make this happen. Um, and that was, I guess, one of the feedback that Clement mentioned that, you know, we never said no, like Kimiko and I. Where it's just always like, oh, that, you know, if it sounds difficult, it's like, well, how can we make that work? So just having that mentality to just always be open to different things, I think helped, you know, with finding different ways to create these spaces for people to come in, whether it's going to be little things like, you know, they're opening up for the Nikkei block party because, you know, like with Kanji, he's like, hey, I want to do the song. And we're like, oh, where could we put this? Right. And at first, you know, you dropped it um, on one of the days, but we're like, we don't know if people are actually seeing it because it's not thematically tied because we had, you know, things for each day. So it's like, okay, how can we get more people to see it? And then so we spliced some of that content into the Nikkei block party, but then had that karaoke event where they did it live. So um, just being open to just different things and then working with the people who want to provide content um, I think that's just the only way is basically through communication and trying to find people's needs. And I'll say things like evolved over time. So something that came up like at least halfway through was like a Facebook group. Like people can comment like the live chat, obviously on this live stream programs, which were not um, every day. So, you know, it was a percentage of the daily programs that were actually live streamed. So obviously the YouTube chat is a great way for folks to get engaged. Um, but the Facebook group allowed people to like continue to talk to each other offline and share their thoughts about programs, have conversations, um, and people still, you know, will post things here and there in that. Um, and I would say the same with the community archive. That was um, something that would flourish over time where people would feel more comfortable to share their stories as they're watching more of what's going on or, you know, a certain program will spark something that they feel a connection to that they want to share. So I think, again, like having many points of entry was one way to do that. Anything you'd want to do differently for next time? Besides not having it nine weeks long. I was just going to say not nine weeks. <laughs> well, um, I, I think Nico kind of mentioned it. It's like just actually having the time to plan it um, and knowing what we want it to look like. Because that was a thing like, you know, we originally had a vision that didn't really match what actually came out, <laughs> you know, like if you were to compare what we talked about in March to what we, you know, finished with on, in August, it's completely different. Um, so yeah, but so just having the time to plan and develop it and then to, you know, curate it a little bit more, I think would be very beneficial because then 
you know, uh, we could maybe have a little bit more quality control. But again, I think that's just the beauty of capturing 2020 um, with our Tadaimo, you know, 1.0 edition, um, because we were just trying to evolve with our new norm, right? By trying to create a community because, you know, Kimiko and I, we don't actually belong in a Japanese American community, like where we, well, at least I didn't grow up with one. And I still don't really have a large community in Idaho to really fall back on. So I use the pilgrimages to get my, you know, fill my bucket with, you know, that community love that I don't really get on a, a daily or monthly, um, you know, level. And so not having these pilgrimages, I knew that it was going to impact me. So I was like, we need, we need to, you know, I, so I selfishly did this <laughs> so that I could fill my bucket and, um, but yeah, so hopefully like it was very much the community aspect. And so it's like, if we could cur curate how we want to develop that community presence again, we could probably build an even like tighter, more robust community that uh, people feel more engaged with more information that's free flowing because again, yeah, we're just trying to keep up as we go, day of, hours before, like Kimiko and I would be up until like past midnight, like the night before things are supposed to go live, just to make sure we got like the the best, the newest version of whatever the, the schedule is going to be, even though we know once we send it out, it's already like defunct. <laughs> but, you know, we're just trying to get all of that updated and, you know, just to make sure that we could get the information out, even though we weren't successful at always doing it. Well, I would say next year we need uh, an extra Kimiko and an extra Hanako, so you all can work less than 90 hours a week. Wouldn't that be nice? Um, to kind of speak to some of what you're talking about, Hanako, I want to share a comment from Christine. She says, my 91-year-old Nisei dad from Minidoka watched Tadaima every day. It provided much needed entertainment and connection during the pandemic. Thank you for an amazing program. And I think something that struck all of us after the fact of beginning Tadaima, because kind of what you're saying, Hanako, is it was created to fill this vacuum of folks like us, self-proclaimed pilgrimage junkies who would spend our summer going from camp to camp to camp to be in all these really um, intensive, you know, programs um, at the place. But something that was really incredible to see from Tadaima is that you're able to bring the experience to folks who wouldn't be able to join, whether they're a Nisei who's not able to travel anymore, or they're living in Hawaii or in Japan, like Ayaka is. And um, so there was so much value of it that we didn't anticipate. And so I think that's something for the future where we've talked about, even if we're able to continue with physical pilgrimages to still have some sort of digital component for folks to continue to engage um, from afar. Well, so I have to have a response to that because Kimiko, this is actually why she really wanted to do this. But she's like, well, because you were telling me, you're like, how are we going to engage the people who can't visit the sites? Oh. You know, so that was actually one of the first things that you said. And I remember, you know, we're trying to figure out, like, how could we do elder sessions within, you know, um, the sites, especially with COVID and whatnot? Because I was just more focused on, like, trying to get the content, like, because I, I was thinking you wanted the content coming out, but not the content going in. And, um, but I think you already had it in your mind. I just didn't really fully comprehend that until like a few weeks in, once I start getting emails from folks where they're like, hey, I'm watching this with my elderly father who has dementia, and he is now talking about his experience. Or other people are having a sense of closure that, you know, the community is talking about it. And there's time and space provided to allow for the space of healing or just or they could just share it with their you know grandchildren or children or just friends and family um so yeah no um i think it was very much in kimiko's mind and then eventually it came into my mind after you know to start observing it well and as far as as you know next year next to daima I definitely, and, and if anybody has any suggestions for this, please contact me through JAMP or whatever. I, I just really want to figure out a way to be able to have elders who may be, who might be living alone, living in assisted living, living in a nursing facility, be able to access this content because I do feel like it, 
helps with some closure, but then it, it also sparks conversations like Hanukkah was saying, you know, I think she got a, a you know, a comment from somebody whose elderly father was actually starting to speak about his experience. And I know I've, I've seen emails where people said, oh, this actually sparked a conversation within my own family. And I was just like, yes, like that's amazing. Because we, I just, you know, cannot stress enough that the elders are like our most precious resource and we have to, to engage them for as long as we possibly can, because they're definitely by far the best thing about any pilgrimage. And if there's any way that we can uh, have younger people be able to have these discussions with elders, you know, even if it's not in person, I think it just is so life altering. And I, I just would, you know, if there's a way, again, if anybody has any comments, just email me, Kimiko at jampilgrimages.com because I need to figure this out. Like, how can we get these into like nursing facilities and, and other places where people might also be feeling isolated and, and not with their families? Yeah, that's a great point. Let's put our heads together on that one. Okay, I have a question from Ayaka. Um, she said, thank you for the wonderful pilgrimage. Did you make any preparation for welcoming global participants who may not be familiar with the history of the Japanese American incarceration and pilgrimages? Well, I, I think that's why we had like the opening ceremony to try to provide opportunity for like that, that look, you know, so they could kind of get the background and in going into it. Um, and then we also had like, again, different entry points, what, you know, for people to connect with the story as well. Um, because, you know, some people, they may not want to listen to that history session, whatnot. But the one thing was, you know, shout out to Emily Taroka, who is a great writer, where she put together some um, really great like sequences, like, you know, to music, that it's basically telling the story from immigration to like, incarceration through a music video essentially, right? And um, so there are different ways to either do it like through images or through words or through other programming. So, you know, hopefully we are able to get people that way, you know, but that could be something that we could refine for, for the next one. Yeah, I definitely think we need to, since we'll have more time to plan, definitely do more subtitling um, you know, being able to make it more accessible to to people who might have hearing issues. I know that that was also another comment that I got from some people that I know who um, have problems hearing because of their hearing aids. Um, and then also just people who don't speak English. We, we didn't really, you know, do anything on that end. So we definitely would put more thought into that. Um, and, and even, you know, if there are people who, who can't hear and then we need to do sign language or something like we definitely want to make it as completely accessible as possible. I will say there was some really incredible translation work to have a Q&A live I believe with a filmmaker based in South America so that was a consideration at some point but something that we want to integrate more. Okay some um, happy feedback for you Kimiko. Emily says history is just learning about people. History is for everyone. And NCPH echoes that and says, public history is all about presenting history outside of academia and making it accessible to everyone regardless of their background. So they would definitely call you a public historian, Kimiko. Oh, thank you. And then Thomas Kurihara, hello Thomas, good to see you joining us, says, good to Hi, hear the Thomas. story behind the scenes. Um, <laughs> but from the viewer side, it seemed to be working seamlessly and well orchestrated with excellent content, well done. And then we have feedback from Warrenville Historical saying, we've had really good luck contacting local nursing homes, giving them our content, and then they stream them through their own broadcast system. So that's some really great feedback to work actually with nursing home homes. I think for us, we could definitely get like KRO um, and Nikkei Manor, you know, the community-based homes. Mm -hmm. Thank All you. Right. Well, I think we've gotten to everyone's questions, feel free to drop a last question if you have one. Um, but just any final thoughts, Kimiko and Hanako, I think for me, this program, just looking back on Tadaima, just kind of brought up again, how special it was to have that time together. You know, I think we all missed the physical pilgrimages this summer, but this was really its own 
kind of beast, but in the best way possible. Yes, it took so much work behind the scenes, but um, because it was so sustained, I think the community engagement aspect was just so in depth and incredible. And I think we all got connected to people all over the world that we hadn't been with before in ways that we don't get to do with the traditional pilgrimages. So I thought it was great. Yeah, I think, um, yeah, I was just really excited to just work with such a, a large breadth of people, essentially, from different like institutions, you know, because again, I learned so much about that. But I think, you know, it, it was really good to see people didn't completely think we're crazy and wanted to believe in this. And so we all finally, you know, believed in it together and we made it happen. And so that was to me the, the magic of Tadaima um, was getting everyone just so excited about it to actually complete this project. And it was truly a community program. Like we could not have done it without our community. And I hope that the community, um, like different people within the community felt like they were able to have a space. And if not, hopefully we could create a space next time. And sorry if you didn't. No, no. And then I, I'll, I see your, I see your question, Ken. Um, I, I can answer that. Um, so I, I was almost always the person that was monitoring the chats for the live discussions and I, I would say only once or twice did I have to do any kind of moderating for that. Um, we did have, and it wasn't even, it was just somebody just being inappropriate. It wasn't any, any big deal. So I just basically kicked them out. But for the most part, we had no trolls. I, even now I, I was worried that maybe um, because the content's all still up, that maybe people will have will find it and then post something inappropriate. Nobody has. Uh, I'm pleasantly surprised because uh, you know the internet is is not always a nice place. But um, yeah, everybody has. It's just it's all been positive. So um, yeah, yeah. And I think the sometimes the most interesting part of not the most interesting, but a really cool part of the program was just seeing the conversation take off in the live chat. Um, and I think that was an important aspect of the programs. Um, Emily asks, what are some of the lesser known stories you plan to focus on next time? Do you have any thoughts for one year out on what you might include? Oh gosh, there's there's so many. I mean, there's so many of the, the smaller camps or the DOJ camps, you know, and, and even, um, I can't remember who who did this, was it? Jay say that had the the talk about LGBTQ in camp. You know what I'm talking about? Somebody out there I know knows what I'm talking about. I can't remember. It was just recently, like last week. Um, but you know, just different types of uh, stories, identity stories. Um, you know, there might even be stories. I know something that we didn't touch upon um, that I actually wanted to. We just never got it got to do it, but um, our good friend, Nancy Ukai, who does the 50 Objects Project, um, she has a special place in her heart for James Wakasa, who was shot and killed in Topaz. And so we wanted to do a discussion on um, violence in camp. We never got to do that. It just, you know, so there were a lot of uh, ideas that came too late that we just couldn't work fast enough to get. So, I mean, definitely those type of things. Obviously, Emily, if you're willing to do any other cooking, we will be more than happy to have you and Clement uh, cooking whatever disgusting things Clement can find, uh, you know, at our Sunday suppers. But uh, just any and any and all kinds of avenues that we might not be, um, you know, that we might not have really touched upon too much. Um, I know I, I was very, I felt very derelict since I do the Jerome Rower pilgrimage and we didn't have a whole lot of Jerome Rower content, but I do feel like those two camps get a little bit sidelined from the rest because they were so different. Um, you know, they have much more stories of obviously Jim Crow and, you know, their camps weren't a swamp, they weren't in a desert. And, you know, there's just so many different things with those camps that we could have gotten into, just did not have the the bandwidth to get there. So yeah. And, and, 
honestly, if anybody else has any suggestions, anyone out there, any any of our super fans like like Ken and Thomas and David, um, yes, I'm name checking all of you, uh, Sheila Newlin, if you're out there, uh, you know, if if anybody has suggestions, we would we will love to hear them because we feel like, oh, I should say, I feel like this is a community driven thing, and therefore, if the community wants something or they want to see something let us know and we'll make it happen. That's what we do, you know, just let us know what topics you want us to talk about and, and we'll make it happen if we can. Definitely, there's still many new stories to come out. You know, this is a story of 120,000 people. There's way more stories than that. Um, Emily has voluntold herself and Clement. Clement says, this partnership increased our viewership by bringing so many others to view each other programs and was a great way to raise awareness of all of our work. Um, so Emily and Clement are from the Japanese American National Museum, obviously a huge partner in this. So just so happy to um, have everyone working together on these programs. I'm just so excited for what kind of collaboration lies ahead in this type of programming. So thank you, everyone. All right, well, I think I'll wrap it up now, but thank you so much for joining everyone. And thank you again to the NCPH for bringing this program to you. And stay tuned for more programs from JAMP, including next Friday. We'll see you there. And the Pearl Harbor program by Hanako in right. December. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.